Hello again. Today we are going to study lesson 45, what baptism indicates, and we're going to talk about how baptism changes our lives. So we begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing upon us today that we realize uh, who we are in Christ and in our baptism and how that is to change our lives so that we live for you and serve you and we ask your blessing upon our time in Jesus name Amen. I'd like to begin by looking at some of our memory and last week we had assigned page 293 of the Catechism certain verses uh, Acts 22:16, Ananias said to Paul, And now why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. And now why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. So this is to emphasize the blessing of baptism it brings the forgiveness of sins which Jesus won for us on the cross here it washes away sins it's God's delivery mechanism and so also then it brings a person to faith and so it saves a person and at the bottom of the page Titus 3 5 we learn the first three lines he saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration, a washing which gives us a spiritual rebirth, a washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> then we encouraged you to learn the top of page 292, what benefits does baptism gives? Luther wrote, it works forgiveness of sins, rescues from death and the devil, and gives eternal salvation to all who believe this as the words and promises of God declare. We want you to learn two other Bible verses and I'm going to go over them today and the first of them is on page 294 a beautiful picture of baptism given in Galatians 3.27 which is at the bottom of page 294 for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And that's the only part that I'd like you to memorize, just that one line. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, like a clothing, like a fur coat. So what does clothing give us? It protects us from the elements, from rain and the snow and uh, sleet so in baptism we put on Christ like a coat protects us from our enemies of sin, death, and the devil. So a very beautiful picture of baptism here. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So I want you to memorize that verse. And then uh, finally we have Acts 2 verse 42 on page 301 page 301. This tells what the early Christians were doing in Jerusalem after Pentecost Day when so many people became Christians. What did these Christians do? Acts 2.42, top of page 301, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, that's the, the 12 disciples. These are the men that wrote the New Testament, so Bible teaching they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, gathering together to the breaking of bread, which we think is a reference to the Lord's Supper, and the prayers. So those are four things we want to do as Christians. We want to hear God's word, gather with our fellow Christians, uh, pray to God, and receive the Lord's Supper. So if you have those four things, you're doing pretty well. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and to fellowship, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Uh, those are things we want you to memorize. Now we want to spend a moment, I forgot last week, but 
we want to uh, learn the New Testament books of the Bible, and I showed you how to do that. <clears throat> the first eight, and uh, of those eight, the first four are the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians. And then the Go Eat Popcorn, and all of these, by the way, are found on page 371 of the Catechism. And by the way, if, if you don't have this catechism, you can get it at our church office, or you can go to Concordia Publishing House, or cph.org, and order one for yourself. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians. Then the Go Eat Popcorn, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. The five T's, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, 1st and 2nd Titus. Then the hard ones, the five, Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter. You might notice that three of those five start with a P. The first and then the last two, Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter. So that might help you a little bit. And then the five J's, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, Jude, and the Revelation of John. So let's try it. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Go eat popcorn. Five T's, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, three of those five with a P, the five J's, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, Jude, and the Revelation of John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, Jude, and the Revelation of John. We want to turn now in our workbook, <clears throat> the 60 Lesson Confirmation Book, to page 181. If you don't have the book, if you're an adult listening in, it's not important to have the book in front of you because we're going to be looking at a number of Bible verses and we're going to start page uh, 181, What Baptism Indicates. And we want to highlight that first question and Luther's answer, what does such baptizing with water indicate? It indicates that the old Adam in us should by daily contrition, that's uh, admitting our sins, and repentance, <clears throat> so God, I know that I've sinned, be the old Adam, the sinful part of us, the sinful nature in us, be drowned and die with all sins and evil desires. There's a certain part of us that we want to drown and we want to kill. And that's how we want to treat it. That's our old sinful nature, our old sinful flesh. We're going to talk about that. And that a new man should daily emerge and arise and live before God in righteousness and purity forever. And then he quotes from Romans chapter 6. So we're going to look at Romans chapter 6. <clears throat> but before we do, there's a little box there and it says, why do people make themselves over? We have a lot of TV programs like the house makeovers or personal appearance makeovers. Why do people make themselves over in some way? Well, it's because they're not happy with the way they look and uh, or how they feel. And so the, what do they do? Well, they'll put on makeup, they'll uh, get surgery to make their nose look better, uh, they get uh, their hair done, they get special clothing, everything to make themselves look better. So as Christians, we want to not look better on the outside, but we want to look better on the inside. And baptism begins that process. So we're looking at Romans chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. And this is from the English Standard Version. So look it up in your Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans 6. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? 
So is it okay to just go on sitting knowing that God's going to forgive us? No, Paul says, no, by no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Go, whoa, we died to sin. When did that happen? And he goes on and tells us, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? So we died to sin when we were baptized. And we were baptized into Christ's death. We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. So something incredible happened to us when we were baptized. We were connected with Christ's death and burial and his death and burial and what it did for us uh, becomes ours. And uh, he, Paul says here, we died to sin. I think a couple weeks ago I used this illustration, but I'll use it again. And, and that is when my grandfather uh, uh, died, a, a godly Christian man, uh, you know, I no longer talk to him. I have no association with him. And that's kind of the idea Paul gives us here, that when we were baptized, we died to sin. We say, I don't want anything to do with sin anymore. Uh, I have no association with it anymore. And that, that should be our attitude. That's actually what happened to us. We disassociate ourselves from sin. Verse 5, For if we have been united with him in a death like his, that is again through our baptism, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self, uh, the old man, the sinful nature in us, sometimes called the flesh, not flesh like this flesh of our skin, but uh, the sinful nature in us that has sinful ideas, thoughts, and inclinations. Our old self was crucified with him, Jesus, in order, when we were baptized, in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing. So. Now that I've been baptized, I'm not to use my body for sinful things. <clears throat> our old, the rule of our sinful nature has been crushed. Our sinful flesh no longer rules over us. Now, for the unbeliever, the sinful nature rules over him and, and pushes him and forces him to sinful thoughts, words, and deeds. But now, the sinful flesh no longer rules over me, and I can fight against sin, and I can live a better life. Uh, a life that glorifies God. Uh, things don't have to be sin, sin, sin all the time. We can win victory over sin. Verse 7, for one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So this is what we are to think. I'm a baptized child of God. I was connected to Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection in my baptism, and I've died to sin. I don't want any association with sin. I am now alive to God to live a holy life. And then he goes on in verse 12, we'll end there. Let not sin therefore reign, rule in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. So uh, sin no longer rules over us. Uh, God the Holy Spirit rules inside of us. Now we're going to uh, write a couple things down on the bottom of page 181. And it asks, how are you different now that you have been baptized? And not only are you a child of God, but we're going to add some things that Paul said here in Romans chapter 6. I'd like you to add a couple phrases here. I actually have written in four of these things. I consider myself dead to sin. You can write that in. I consider myself dead to sin. I don't want anything to do with sin anymore. <clears throat> I consider myself dead to sin. Number two, you can write in. As I write pretty small, but you can keep going on. 
uh, in the space that you have, do the best you can. We are no longer slaves to sin. That's the second thing I wrote. We are no longer slaves, or I am no longer a slave of sin. I don't have to do what the devil wants me to do. I don't have to do what sin wants me to do. Third, I am alive to God to live a new life. I am alive to God to live a new life. And these are all things Paul was talking about here in Romans chapter 6. I am alive to God to live a new life. And number four, sin is not to rule over me, to reign. The sin is not to rule over me. I don't have to sin. This is really a great blessing. Sometimes people think, oh, the sin is fun. If I could just live, do whatever I wanted, it'd all be fun, fun, fun. But you look at the lives of unbelievers and often it's just a wreck. So uh, relationships are a wreck. Their relationship with God is a wreck. They're fighting amongst each other. As a Christian now, you can live a new life in which uh, God blesses and there's peace and harmony, not only with God, but with others. So Romans 6, a great, great passage. And now we are going to turn to Ephesians chapter 4. And we're on page 182 of the workbook, but in the Bible, we're turning to Ephesians, go eat popcorn, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Ephesians chapter 4. And we're going to talk a little bit about the old man and the new man and what these things are. Ephesians 4, verse 17. Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. And he's talking about those who don't know Christ. And walk is, is used uh, uh, as a way of saying um, living your life. Um, so you don't want to live your life, walk like the unbelievers. You're, you're not an unbeliever. How do they live? In the futility of their minds, their minds aren't thinking right. They are darkened in their understanding, understanding, alienated, apart from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. So they're just doing whatever they want to do, whatever sin they can think of. But that is not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus, to put off the old self. Uh, the old self. Put off the old self. Which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. So how does he... We call this the old self or the old man, also the old Adam, and the sinful flesh. All of those phrases talk about the same thing. And your translations translates the same word with, in different ways like this. The old man is the old self, uh, the old Adam in us, or the sinful flesh. What does Paul say about this old sinful flesh in us. It's corrupt. It has deceitful desires. It deceives us and it has sinful desires. So what are we to do with that old part? There's that sinful part of us. Even after you've come to be, uh, be a Christian, your sins are forgiven, there's this part of you that's still wicked and wants to do wrong. And you want, There's a part of you that wants to sin. Paul says, uh, Put it off like uh, clothing. Take it off. Put it aside. That's something we're doing all the time. And to be renewed by the spirit of your minds, to put on the new self created. So this is something God created in us when we became Christians. He gave us this new self, this new man. We distinguish between the Holy Spirit 
which we capitalize the H and the S because that's God and it's a title, the Holy Spirit. Sometimes the Bible refers to the Spirit as a small s, referring to this new man, this new being, this new part that God puts in us that wants to do the will of God. So have you ever seen, I forget what uh, cartoon it was, a movie that they've got this guy and he's got a devil on one shoulder and an angel on the other shoulder and they're arguing. The one wants them to do something evil, the other wants them to do something good. And, uh, and that's the way it is with the old self and the new self, the old man and the new man. There's this wicked side of us that wants to do evil. And then God the Holy Spirit created this spirit with a small s, this new man in us, that wants to do what is right. So we are to put off the sinful flesh, the old man, and we are to put on, like clothing, the new man, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So this new man wants to do what's right. So if we look at uh, our book here on page 182, there's three boxes, and I'd like you to write some things in there. Describe the old Adam, the flesh, the uh, old man. Well, I'd write things in like this. Sinful thoughts, sinful thoughts. The old Adam, the old man, I'd write in, thinks sin is fun. He thinks sin is fun. He has sinful thoughts. He thinks sin is fun. The old Adam in us resists the Bible and prayer. So there's a part of us that says, I, I don't want to open the Bible. I don't want to read the Bible. I don't want to pray to God. That's a wicked, horrible thing. But that's part of our sinful flesh. It's in league with the devil. And league is L-E-A-G-U-E. L-E-A-G-U-E. It's in league with the devil. That's a horrible thing. That we have this sinful flesh. And the way we treat it, trying to get rid of it. Um, do Christians sometimes have really wicked thoughts? Have you ever thought about killing someone? Have you ever thought, well, that'd be a good, good idea? Uh, you know, Christians can have really wicked thoughts. But how do you deal with that? You repent of it. And that's why Luther says, he says, how, how do you deal with your old Adam? He says, by daily contrition and repentance. Be drowned and die. So you, you get a wicked thought like that and you say, Oh Lord, that's a wicked thought. I, I, that's really sinful. I, I'm sorry for that. And I need Jesus' forgiveness. Thank you for forgiving me for Jesus' sake and help me to have better thoughts. So you drown, drown those thoughts. Describe the new man. Well, I'd write in things like good thoughts loves God and his word and prayer, hates sin. So I don't want to sin. Good thoughts, loves God and his word and prayer. See, write these kinds of things in. Hates sin, wants to serve God and others. So that's the new man. God put this new man, this spirit with a small s, and it wants to do what's right. And, and holy. So it's a great thing to have the new man. Now it says in the third box, describe how the old Adam, the old man, and the new man interact with each other. Well, the, the answer is they're fighting each other, trying to gain supremacy. <clears throat> the old man wants to rule and drag us back into the devil's kingdom. But God wants the new man, so the Holy Spirit works with our new man to live a new life of holiness. So how do you deal with the old man? Daily contrition and repentance. You say, God, I'm sorry for the sinful thoughts I've had this day. I need your forgiveness. Your forgiveness. Help me to battle against that sinful flesh. How do you, do you uh, put on the new man? 
Well, you do things like read the Bible, you study the Bible like we're doing here, and you pray, and you take the Lord's Supper for strength of faith. There's a story about a man who had two dogs. Uh, they were both the same size. They looked very similar to each other. One was very kind and loving. The other one uh, bit people all the time. It was just a real problem. So what do you do with these two dogs? Well, you feed the one, the good dog, you starve the other. I'm just using this as an illustration. I'm not advocating uh, animal cruelty. But you get the idea. You want to encourage the one. You feed the good dog. You starve the other one. So how do you feed the good one? You do the godly things like read the Bible and receive the Lord's Supper to strengthen your faith. Uh, gather together with other Christians who share God's Word. You know, who do you associate with? And you uh, uh, Starve the sinful flesh. You avoid places where you know you will be tempted. Uh, you uh, start having sinful thoughts. You, you quickly pray. And uh, you go and be around godly people. I have a friend who, when he was young, you know, he, he'd, he'd think about girls a lot. He was single. And he was afraid of, of being tempted by lust. And so he said, uh, and every time I'd get together with him, he would be able to look up in the sky and he'd tell you exactly what model of plane was flying over. And he knew every kind of car, its make and model. And I'm like, how do you know all this? He says, I said, why do you do that? Why, do you, why have you learned all that? He said, it keeps my mind off girls. You see, he was trying to feed the new man so that he wouldn't, think about sinful things. And that was a good idea for him. So the whole idea here is that we are in war. We are at war with our sinful flesh. There is a whole section of our, our hymnal that talks about Christian warfare. It's on page 66 or hymn 66, 660 approximately. And I'm going to read you a couple of verses of hymn 663. There are three great enemies to your faith. Uh, verse 2, watch against the devil's snares, his traps. So the first is the devil, lest asleep. You know, you're sleeping, you're not being, you're not studying the word of God, you're not praying, you're not gathering with other Christians, lest asleep he find you. For indeed, no pains he spares to deceive and blind you. Satan's prey, that's what you are. Oft are they who secure our sleeping. You think, oh, I don't have, I don't, no problems here. I don't have anything to worry about. And no watch are keeping. Enemy number two, watch, let not the wicked world. Now, the world doesn't mean the physical world here. It means the world of unbelievers who really are in the devil's kingdom and so try to get you to be involved in the devil's works. Let not the wicked world with its lies defeat you. So there's all kinds of lies in our world and on the TV and books. Lest with bold deception hurled it betray and cheat you. Watch and see, lest there be faithless friends to charm you. So, who are your friends? Are they people that believe in Jesus? Who but seek to harm you? Verse 4, watch against yourself, my soul. Now he's getting into what we've been talking about, the sinful flesh, the sinful old man in us lest with grace you trifle. Let not self your thoughts control, the sinful self, don't let them control your, it control your thoughts, nor God's mercy, mercy stifle. Pride and sin lurk within all your hopes of eternal life to shatter. Heed not 
when they flatter. So these sinful thoughts can be very flattering, very good, seem good, seem good and pleasurable. Sin seems good and pleasurable, but they will only harm you. So the good news is that because we are baptized children of God, we can live a new life. God gives us this new man, this new self, and it fights against the old self, the old Adam in us. <clears throat> now the important thing here is that, well, let me say this, my wife and I like to watch survival shows on TV, so we watch survival, um, alone, where one individual is put out, there are, you know, maybe ten individuals, but they're all placed in different places in a wilderness, and they have to try to survive all by themselves. And what happens in these situations is that people go along for a few weeks and because of the lack of food or the danger of predators, they finally give up. Some of them you can just see that, that they're just too weary. They just say, I've had it, I want to go home. And so they surrender. Now in war, they would used to throw up the white flag, you know, wave the white flag, I surrender. You know, that's what you don't want to do as a Christian. When the devil tempts and the world tries to deceive you, your sinful flesh uh, is saying, hey, uh, go ahead and live a sinful life. <clears throat> you don't want to just surrender and say, nah, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, that's okay. I'm just going to give in to all the sin around me. You know, that's, a re that's when you're really in danger. What you want to do is fight, uh, and you fight against uh, the sinful flesh and the devil. And that is actually an indication that you're a Christian. It's not that a Christian is going to be perfect. Now, we would like to be perfect. We strive to be perfect. But we know that we have a sinful flesh and we're not going to be perfect. So we repent of our sins, daily contrition and repentance. We receive Jesus' forgiveness and we ask the Holy Spirit to help us to live a new and holier life. <clears throat> And so then we go back into the world and we say, tomorrow I'm going to do a better job with the strength of the Holy Spirit uh, to live a holy life. Let the new man rise and beat down the old man. If you turn to page 183 of the book, it uh, mentions that <clears throat> give, uh, write, you know, draw some pictures of what, what it would mean to uh, be in this battle, to, to uh, have the old man and the new man, what does the daily life of a Christian look like? And I'm just going to give you a couple ideas. <coughs> Excuse me. Maybe you have one or two on your own already from what we've talked about, but you can draw a little picture there of what your life looks like. Now, the first picture is of a person taking off a coat and putting on a new coat. <clears throat> and that would be the picture of taking off the old man, the sinful flesh, saying, I don't want anything to do with my sinful flesh, and putting on the new man, which is that thing, that spirit, that part of us that the Holy Spirit creates in us when we become Christians and baptized. Now we have this new man, this new coat, that wants to obey God. So this picture of taking off the sinful flesh and then putting on the coat of the new man. So that's one picture. That's what we are to do every day as Christians. So the second picture is this. If you were to go out in the ocean or in your pool in the backyard, if you have one, and you take a beach ball, all blown up, air, air inflated, and you try to drown it. You know what happens when you try to immerse a beach ball underwater? Well, it pops right back up. Uh, that's what you do to your sinful flesh. You try to drown it. You try to kill it. <clears throat> you, you, you put it under the water. You don't want to have anything to do with it. Sad to say, <clears throat> excuse me, again, sad to say that it, it pops up. It, it, we can't get rid of it. We won't get rid of it until we finally die. 
and go to heaven or when Jesus comes again. And that's one of the great blessings of Jesus' second coming is that we will not have our sinful flesh anymore. The old Adam will be gone, the old man will be gone and we'll live before God in perfect holiness. So drowning the sinful flesh like a beach ball, that's another picture. The third picture you might draw is that of the two dogs. And you can write, draw one dog and you'll say the, the old man, and the second dog, the new man. And uh, the one you starve and the other you feed. But these two dogs fighting with each other. Uh, you want the good dog, the new man, to win. And this is a constant battle, a daily battle that we have. Now on page 184, it says, how do you remember your baptism? Well, you can make the sign of the cross. And we do that here in class. We do it in worship. Uh, we start our services with the invocation. I, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And uh, that reminds us of our baptism. And when I make the sign of the cross, either like this or upon myself, I say, I'm a baptized child of God. And I have the name of the triune God upon me, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So, I am a Christian. And I love to be a Christian, so it's a good thing to make the sign of a cross. Uh, secondly, <clears throat> you can write your baptism date in your calendar and a lot of us have calendars on our phones now so you can so it comes to my baptism birthday and I can say hey I was baptized on this day and you can celebrate your baptism birthday you could really celebrate your baptism birthday just like you celebrate your own birthday maybe you want to bake yourself a cake uh, when little children are baptized in our church we give them a candle to remind them of their their baptism, it's a baptismal candle, so maybe if you have that, you could light that baptismal candle on the day of your baptism, or the annual date of your baptism. Once again, why do you remember, why do we want to remember our baptisms? I think I said this the other day, and there are three things. First, it reminds you that you are a child of God. You've been brought to faith in the Savior. Uh, secondly, it reminds you that you are a new creation, Romans chapter 6, and as such, you are to live a new life. You are a child of God. You can't live like an unbeliever anymore. Thirdly, it reminds you, reminds me, that I am part of Christ's body, the church. I wasn't baptized to be a loner all by myself. I was baptized to be part of a congregation of believers and that's what Paul wrote in 1st Corinthians 12 verse 13 for in one spirit we were all baptized into one body Jews or Greeks slave or free we all were made to drink from one spirit so it doesn't matter who you are your background whatever it is uh, we were baptized into one body. We are one Christian church with our fellow believers. So that's really great. In other words, you have brothers and sisters in Christ because you have been baptized. <clears throat> so we want to go to our catechism and just kind of review. Uh, we've talked about most everything here that we want to talk about. And uh, we're going into our catechism now to page 302, and I'm going to ask you to highlight certain things, and this is kind of a review. <clears throat> the, uh, excuse me. Uh, and in uh, Luther's part, the box at the top, he says, what does such baptizing with water indicate? It indicates that the old Adam, the sinful nature in us, should by daily contrition and repentance, that's acknowledging our sin, repenting of it, <clears throat> turning to Christ for forgiveness this old Adam the sinful nature be drowned and to die we want to kill it with all sins and evil desires <clears throat> excuse me my allergies acting up here 
and that a new man should daily emerge and arise to live before God in righteousness and purity forever. Under the central thought, it says, how do people today try to make themselves new? And I'd highlight the next sentence, the next paragraph. Baptism embraces our entire lives as believers. It affects our whole lives. It means death to all of our selfishness and sin, and that God is making new people out of us. We might have had a rotten background. We've been, we are now a new creation in our baptism, and God is making our lives better, uh, new and better people out of us. Then I'd highlight that bold part. As Christians, we confess, I am baptized and now I have a daily battle, confessing my sins and drowning them and also living a new life according to God's goodness and love. If you go to the bottom of the page, what is the old Adam? I'd highlight the words old man or old self. Those are other words for this sinful nature in us. What is the new man? And after that question, I would write in quotations the word spirit with a small s to distinguish it from the Holy Spirit with a large s. So this new man is the spirit that God created in us. And I'd highlight then the new man, highlight that, and then highlight on the third line, new spirit created attitudes, desires, and actions. So the new man has new spirit created attitudes, desires, and actions. So when it comes to Sunday morning and your parents say, it's time to get up for church, there's always going to be a battle. The sinful flesh will say, hmm, I'm kind of lazy, I don't really need to hear the word of God, I heard all that stuff before. The new man in you says, hey, this is an opportunity to grow in your faith, to learn something from the word of God, to thank him for the gifts he gives you, to receive the Lord's Supper for the strengthening of your faith, and, and strength to live a holier life, to, and to be with my fellow believers. So that's how the new man thinks. Number 321, how do the old Adam and the new man interact? I'd highlight that question and the answer. They are engaged in an ongoing life and death struggle. Uh, so this isn't just some little war, this is the big war. This uh, uh, war results either in eternal death and hell or eternal life with Christ. Number 322, how does baptism picture what Christ Christian's daily life should look like? In the waters of baptism we have been buried and raised with Christ, Romans 6. Therefore we should continually, and I'd highlight, resist every impulse of the old Adam until he is drowned once and for all when we die. So he's not going to get, we're not going to get rid of him completely until we die. But that's our daily goal. We're not going to say, well, hey, I got this sinful flesh, this sinful man. Um, I'm just going to sin. No, I can't do anything about it. No, our goal is to live a perfectly holy life and not sin each day. The reality is we won't be able to do that. But that's our goal. And it's important to know that, that that's our goal. So I'd highlight, resist every impulse of the old Adam until he is drowned once and for all when we die. At the same time, we should continually, and then I'd highlight the words, give free reign or rule to the new man. Give free reign to the new man. Say, go ahead, new man, go for it. Uh, live a new life of holiness. If you turn to page 304, there's Ephesians 4.24, put on the new self, I highlighted that, put on the new self. And Galatians 2.20 is a beautiful passage. <clears throat> I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh I live by faith in the Son of God 
who loved me and gave himself for me. I love that last phrase. That's what it means to be a Christian, to say, he loved me. He gave himself on the cross for me. And what we're talking about here is what is it that moves you to drown the old man and to let the new man arise? And it's this, that you know what Christ did for you. Christ loved me and gave himself up for me on a cross. That's, I'm so thankful, I want to live a holy life. And Christ now lives in me and he helps me to live this new life. And he's given me this new self along with the Holy Spirit. So I've got all these pluses helping me to live a new life. Number 323, the bottom of page 304 of the Catechism. What words do we remember? What words do we use to remember our baptism? Well, the words of Matthew 28 in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The Trinitarian invocation. Invocation again means to call on God. We use this invocation in the divine service, in our worship service. So I'd highlight that question, what words do we use in our, to remember our baptism? And I'd highlight the first three lines. We remember our baptism with the words in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Matthew 28, 19, the Trinitarian invocation. When we use these words in the divine service, I'd highlight all of that. And then highlight the words, we recall and confess before heaven, earth, and hell that all that God has given us in our baptism. So we say, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I am a baptized child of God, and I remember all the blessings God has given me in my baptism. <clears throat> now you go to the bottom of that paragraph, and I'd highlight that note. The Trinitarian invocation may be accompanied by the sign of the cross made at our baptism upon our foreheads. You know, the pastor said, that receive the sign of the cross upon your forehead, upon your chest, to mark you as one who is redeemed by Christ the crucified. So I'd highlight that paragraph as well. Now we go to the prayer on page 305 and that's where we'll close. And This will bring us to the end of the study of baptism. Uh, I may do a review lesson on the line to prepare the confirmands for the test they will be taking. Very important to, to review so that you can successfully complete the test. And you don't want to just go through these classes and listen and just kind of let it pass through one ear and out the other. You want to learn something about your baptism and why it's so important. And also so that when you become an adult and you have children, you can answer the question, should I baptize my child? And why would I baptize that child? And you're able to remember daily the the, the blessing of your baptism and how it affects your daily life. Romans chapter 6. So there's the review of baptism and then, then the next unit of study is another means of grace. It's called the office of the keys and there's actually two keys and one is called the absolution and that is also one of the means of grace. So we're going to talk about the two keys, the office of the keys. So let's pray the prayer on page 305. You may join me. Heavenly Father, you have forgiven our sins, rescued us from death and the devil, and given us eternal life by baptism into the death and resurrection of your beloved Son. Strengthen our faith so that we may daily put to death all sins and evil desires, and trusting your sure promises, are raised to live before you in righteousness and purity. Finally, bring us to the fulfillment of our baptism in the resurrection of the body to life everlasting through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.